Hi, this is Pastor Farai. Thank you for listening to one of our sermons here at the Potter's House Church, Sydenham. To listen to more sermons, log on to our website at www.sydenhamcc.com. On behalf of all the saints in the Sydenham Church, we pray that this message blesses you. I had something planned, um, and just as we were worshipping, God was like, no, this is where we're going tonight. Psalms 147, verses 2 and 3, is the scripture that I want to consider this evening. Psalms 147, and verses 2 and 3. Here's what the Bible tells us. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Tonight, I want to speak about how God heals and how God rebuilds. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. And we ask how that you would be glorified, and that you would touch and bring healing and restoration, Father. Lord Jesus, we need you, Father. We're looking to you, Lord. And we're asking, God, that you would have your way. Where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty, Father. And I just pray, Father, that you would touch us and that you would meet with us and that we would truly encounter you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Ruins are a very sad and a very depressive sight. Ruins are often a picture of what was, what used to be. One time there was something that stood glorious, but now it is in ruins. The ruins only serve as a historical representation of reference of of what was. It evidences something that was in the past, but is now no more. Isaiah 64, 11, the people of God, they're crying out concerning the temple and they say, our holy and beautiful temple where our fathers praised you is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. They are looking at the temple. They are looking at something that was once beautiful where they would travel and come to to worship and serve the true and living God. It is a holy place, a place established by God for people to worship. You gotta consider everybody else is bowing to idols and, and statues, things that have been created out of the imagination of men men. They're bowing down to gold and silver and and wooden things. Uh, But here were the people of God, uh, worshipping the creator of the heavens and the earth. Uh, A God who who cannot be be, uh, uh, concised or fit into man's imagination. That's why he says, make no graven image. He says, as as great as you may think I am, God is even greater than that. As, As wondrous and as powerful as we would think him to be, he is far beyond that. He surpasses all of that. They're worshipping the true and living God in this place, uh, but now it is burned up with fire. All the pleasant things are laid waste. The temple now lies uh, in ruins. Uh, Today you can go to ruins of particular cities that hundreds if not thousands of years ago were thriving places places of industry, places of trade, places where people lived and built their lives. But now, to this day, they lie in ruins, whether it be the ancient city of Babylon or the ancient city of Ephesus. These were cultural capitals in their times. Many people from around the world would find themselves or would migrate to these places. But today, they are desolate. Today, they are empty because they lie in ruins. You can find many historical historical landmarks around Europe, whether it be the Colosseum in Rome or whether it be ancient temples across even the British Isles, you can go to castles and today they are not what they used to be when they when they were first constructed and built. Today they merely serve as a reference of what was. They now lie in ruins. No longer cities of civilization, but only serving as testament of what was. Ruins are often a picture of what used to be. Ruins are also the picture of the devastation of war. 
Many of us have seen some of the imagery that has come out of Ukraine. And especially those cities that have suffered a lot of heavy bombing. And what we see is here are places where people were living and building their lives, but because of the conflict and the devastation of war, it now lies in ruins. It is an image of defeat. It is an image of devastation. It is an image of horror. An enemy has come in and has decimated all that has been built, all that we've tried to construct and push ourselves forward as a society has come crumbling down. It lays in ruin because an enemy has come upon our isles. The picture of ruins, especially in the aftermath or in the devastation of war, is very discouraging. It is painful to behold. People have had to flee their houses and their homes. And when they return, this they, 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 they saved all this money up to purchase this home. This is where we were going to build our lives. But now it lays in ruins. It is a hard thing to process. Ruins are a picture of what was. Ruins are often a picture of the devastation of conflict. Another difficult uh, uh, site is the ruins of, of tragedy. Ruins are often the site of a tragedy. Natural disasters often leave places in ruins, uh, vehicle accidents. Uh, you see the car is, is turned upside down and, and it's, it's dent in particular places. It is it is is in a place, it's in a state, sorry, of ruin. You know that something bad has happened, whether it's an, a, a charred out house that had been caught up in flames. Uh, it is a picture of tragedy. Uh, just during the conference, I had uh, a couple that came uh, with us uh, uh, to be a part of the conference and the husband said, I need to make a trip down to Grenfell Towers because he remembers when he watched that imagery of the, of the flames engulfing that tower and he says, I just need to go and just, just visit that place, uh, visit the ruins of where so many people's lives uh, were affected, where so many people's lives were turned upside down. The wall of them flats used to be people's homes, uh, but because of tragedy, it is now a place of, of ruins. In New York City, there is a 9-11 museum or uh, memorial as well, and it contains uh, some of the structural ruins of the Twin Towers uh, because it serves of a reference of, of a great tragedy that had occurred. And so whether it be a burnt out car, whether it be a plane crash site, uh, whether it be the rubble remains of a devastating Devastating, devastating earthquake. Uh, it is a picture of tragedy. The text tells us uh, that Jerusalem had been in ruins. The walls of Jerusalem had come down and the temple was no more. Ruins is always a difficult sight to, to behold because they only exist uh, after something bad has happened. Here's the reality of life is that there can be things that have broken down and laid ruins in our own lives. Things that we built, things that received a lot of love and a lot of care and a lot of attention, things that were valuable to us, but because of conflict, because of tragedy, because an enemy has come in, they have been broken down. It could be friendships, relationships, a marriage, a family, congregational unity, a vision, a calling of God that once burned in your heart. These things are important things. These things are valuable things, uh, but they can all suffer this reality of being broken down and now they lay in ruins. What was is no longer. There was a point where you and this person were great friends, you spoke to each other, you, you were brothers in arms, as iron sharpens iron, so does one sharpen another's cancer. There, there was a friendship, but, but something happened, there was a conflict, there was a, there was a tragedy, and all of a sudden what was is uh, no longer. It could be a family circumstance or situation, and now it lies in ruins. It could be a marriage, it lies uh, in ruins, it is the aftermath that something desperately has gone wrong here. Now it, now it lies in ruins. Tragedy has occurred. 
conflict has ensued. The Bible says a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. The husband and wife have gone separate ways. The congregation is split. The friendship has become hostility. The family are now at odds and estranged with one another, estranged to one another. The person is now disenchanted with the purposes of, of God. Ruins. The trauma of this can often lead to a breakdown in physical and mental health. The aftermath of ruins can scar you deep down into the depths of your person. The strategy of hell tonight, the temptation often, is that we would, we would disobey God, that we would go our own way and we would tear down what God has developed in us. You've got to consider, even in our text, the Lord builds up Jerusalem, the legacy of Jerusalem, or let me consider, or ask the question, why Jerusalem had become torn down is for the people's, or because of the people's continual turning away from God. Jerusalem lies in ruins because the people continue to turn away. They, they, you can, you can kind of say they tore it down themselves with their historical backsliding from God. That's what the enemy wants us to do. That's why he tempts us to sin, because he knows that God will establish and build things in us. And he wants us through our decisions to tear them down. Now, the natural response to things that are broken down is to discard of them. When we see ruins, we often lose hope. We come to a conclusion or we begin to believe that what was can never be again. That the walls cannot be rebuilt. But our text tells us something different this evening. Verse 2 says, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. We serve a God who is able to rebuild. Amen. Isaiah 61 verse 4 says this, and they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Amos 9:11. on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as it was in the days of old. Ezekiel 36 and verse 36 says then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I the Lord have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desert. I the Lord have spoken it and I will do it. Jeremiah 31 and verse 4 again I will build you and, I, and you shall be rebuilt O virgin of Israel you shall again be adorned with your tambourines and you shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice and so time and time again, we're seeing through the scripture that God is not intimidated by the sight of ruin. He is not discouraged by the sight or the aftermath of tragedy, of conflict. For again and again, he prophesies and he foretells that I will rebuild the old ruins. I will raise up what was now, what has been cast down and destroyed. He will build and he will, and he will rebuild. We serve a God who can rebuild out of the ruins. You know, St. Paul's Cathedral uh, is quite infamous for being destroyed a number of times throughout history. Um, in the, the first time, I believe, well, it was originally built in the seventh century by uh, as an Anglo-Saxon uh, cathedral, um, but it was burnt down in um, nine, 962, not even 19, 960, that's a long time ago. And following, the following structure was destroyed in, um, in a fire in 1087. The construction of the fourth St. Paul's Cathedral began in 1087, 
and disrupted by another fire in 1136. It was again rebuilt and constructed in 1240, and the cathedral spire was destroyed by lightning in 1561. And perhaps most famously, it was completely gutted during the Great Fire of London in 1666. The current cathedral took almost 50 years to complete, being finished in 1711, and a final 15-year restoration project was completed in 2011. Man, I tell you, man, if I preach in that cathedral, I'm preaching this sermon. How God can rebuild. Come on now. This thing has been destroyed so many times, uh, but nevertheless, it has been raised up again. That's the testimony of the saints this evening. That it doesn't matter how many times the enemy will try to come in like a flood and try and bring destruction and chaos and dysfunction to our life. The Bible says a righteous man, though he may fall seven times, uh, he, will, he will raise back up. He can get the back up. God can rebuild from the ruins. He can build up the walls. He can restore the set, uh, the city. He can cause the temple to be reconstructed. That which was decimated, that which was torn down, can be raised back up. Jesus said of himself in John 2, 19, Jesus answered him and said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They thought he was talking about the physical temple that he was standing in, but he was talking about his body. He was setting a precedent. He was setting a, le a, a legacy that though my body would be in ruins, the Bible says he was beaten beyond all recognition. When they looked at him and they saw how mad he was, they were thinking this man will never come back. All that he foretold of him rising again is not going to happen. But nevertheless, he rose himself up from the ruins. Why? Because we serve a God who is able to revive, who is able to restore. We serve a God who rebuilds from the ruins. He makes the latter greater than the former. Psalms 102 verse 16 says, For the Lord shall build up Zion. He shall appear in his glory. He is a rebuilder of what has broken down. You think about it, since the fall of man, you know what God's been doing? He's been rebuilding. He's been restoring from the ruins of sin. Recently I was told about uh, this old pastor, I remember many years ago, um, very anointed, gifted minister. But uh, fortunately he was, he, was in, he was in ministry. Uh, he entered into adultery. Um, and that just was like a grenade going off in his marriage. Uh, and then his marriage broke down, uh, family breakdown, you know, the pain, the violation, the effect it would have had on the congregation, all of this stuff. Uh, and then he ended up getting um, divorced. Uh, last, like many years ago, last week I was hearing he was, he, was, he was losing his mind. His family is in a very, very, very dark place. If you looked at his life, if he told you what was, yeah, he used to be a minister and preach the gospel and I would give words and see miracles and all this kind of stuff. And then you looked at his life where it was, you would say, man, this looks like a ruins. What was is, 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 is no longer. And so, you know what, just a couple of months ago, I was preaching a revival somewhere. And um, I, this guy who I was preaching for is a very close guy of, of, of him. And so I just asked about it. Because sometimes you just never know. I said, did you hear from him? You know how he's doing? And you know what he told me? He says, just not so long ago, he, he's rededicated his life a few years back. He's back in his mother church and he's dating his wife. You know what I turned around and said, man, the devil's got to be fixed. Because the devil done thought that this man is dead. This, he must have told the devil, you know you sign something off, like, just sign, sign him off, man. That's, that's a goner. There's, there's no hope there. But nevertheless, hey, we serve a God who can raise up even out of the ruins. He's a God who restores. He's a God who revives. He is a God who rebuilds. Uh, we might lose hope, but our, our God, he, he, he doesn't. He, he continues to pursue. He leaves the 99 and he goes for the one. Though it is going to show, he says, no, no, I'm going to try and get you back. This is the nature of our God. This is what our text says. He says, I am the God who will rebuild. And so the text tells us, as we consider it, he says, he is the Lord who builds up Jerusalem and gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He's the God who rebuilds, but then verse 3 tells us that he heals. He's a physician. 
He's Jehovah Rapha, which is, I am your healer. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, we read of many miracles where he's healing people. He's touching people and they are being made whole. But our text speaks of a specific healing. This is a healing often that is needed in the aftermath of ruins. It is the healing of the broken heart. Because life can be very difficult. And sometimes we can experience very traumatic and traumatic things. Dramatic, sorry, and traumatic things. Things can happen in our lives that bring a deep sorrow of heart, an internal pain, a, a deep wounding of the soul. The scripture says, he heals the brokenhearted. It's like God knows there's some things that are going to be in ruins because of this life that we live in in this world where we have fallen and broken. And he realizes in the aftermath of that, yes, I am the God who restores and rebuilds out of the ruins, but there is also a healing that needs to take place within the depths of a person because there are many people who can live their heart life and their heart is broken. They are carrying and living with an internal wound. Nehemiah 2 verse 2 says, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Proverbs 15 verse 13. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Jeremiah 4 verse 19. Oh my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. I've read this scripture, and I've known about this text yeah, for a very, very long time. God heals the broken heart. But I didn't realize how real this was into, until very, until two very close people to me lost their spouse last or this year or last year, in the space of 12 months. One is Pastor Jimmy Robinson. Pastor Jimmy Robinson is the pastor that I got saved under. So him and his wife, Eula, they're, they're the people I got saved under. And, uh, and then I moved up to Wolverhampton. And then there is my sister. She lost her husband in February. So Eula died, I believe, about August or July last year. My brother-in-law died February this year. So that's, I don't know, that's a space of like seven, eight months. So two people very close to me who experienced, who experienced uh, the loss of their spouse. And I remember I was, this is, this is my, my brother-in-law's past maybe days, I'm down in Bournemouth and uh, talking to my sister and she's talking to me about this pain in her chest and she says, bro, my chest is hurting me, I tight, I've got a pain there and it's like, I don't know, God must have given me the words because in that kind of situation it's very hard to know what to say and I looked at her and I said, sis, it's because your heart is broken. And she says, yeah, I think that's what it is too. So I remember I went back to Wolverhampton and I went to to Pastor Jimmy. And um, he says, he's talking about his recording when Eula passed. And he says, uh, you know, that during that time, he says in aftermath, he says, man, I had this great pain in my chest. He said it was so severe, it was like, I felt like checking myself into the hospital. And he goes, you know what it was, Leon? And I said, Charlene had that. He said, yeah, a broken heart. A broken heart. And I never knew how real this thing was until these two people communicated to me. And there's actually something real called a broken heart syndrome. It's a temporary heart condition that is often brought on by stressful situations and extreme emotions. People with broken heart syndrome may have sudden chest pain or feel like they're having a heart attack. Broken heart syndrome affects just part of uh, just part of the heart, temporarily disrupting the heart's usual pumping function, and the rest of the heart continues to work properly, but it may even squeeze and contract more forcefully. There are pains in life that are very deep within our person. Yeah. 
Some of us, we can try and cover it up. Proverbs 14, 13 says, even in laughter the heart may sorrow and the end of myrrh may be grief. We can try and put on a brave face, but the reality is we're living broken inside. There are wounds that are deep within us. And we can get to the place where we feel like we can never be healed. Like the hurt is never going to go away because the pain is so deep within our person. In such times, it's very easy to conclude that God is far from you. Sorrow has a way of pulling on us and, and, and the pull is, is downward. And what is needed is a deep, personal, psychological and emotional healing of the soul. Our text tells us he heals the broken hearted. Our God is a healer of the broken heart and of the internally wounded. Our Lord does not only just build things up, but he is a healer. He restores broken hearts as well as he would rebuild a broken wall. Jesus said, uh, or states in Luke 4 verse 18, that he has sent me to heal the broken hearted. Psalms 34 verse 18 says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit it is to those who have the broken heart or are broken hearted that God is nearest the ministry of Christ was to find and heal those who are broken in their hearts Spurgeon speaks on this text and says come broken hearts come to the physician who never fails to heal and cover your wounds to him who so tenderly binds them up Sometimes that's not the easiest thing to do, is to expose a wound. Uh, if you're like me, you just like to get on with life, not talk about it. Because if you're gonna talk about it, or if you're gonna bring it up, then it's gonna hurt. That's the thing about wounds. Wounds are sensitive. Yeah. You have any kind of flesh wound, wound, the last thing you want anybody to do is to touch it. Yeah. You're very protective of it. You don't want anyone unwrapping, messing with it. Why? Because it's a wound. It's something that's happened. There's been a hurt in my life and it still pains me. And so often what we can do is we can bury it and we can try and act like it's not there. But nevertheless, it still manifests in our person. It manifests in our personality. It manifests in other areas of our life. It's sensitive. And so many times we feel like it's easier not to address it. To try and actually normalize it. That's what we do. We try and make it normal. I've got wounds, I've got these issues from my past, these things that have been traumatic situations, but I'm just going to carry on like, like it's normal. It's not normal. In this last year, my own life, like I said, I had to learn. I had to learn this lesson. I, I remember me and my sister realizing, like, we don't know how to mourn. We realized, man, like, my wife was like, like, sir, you, 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 things are happening to you. I was, I was sleeping, right? This or this, like, I, I don't know, maybe a few weeks after, after my brother will pass away. And I'm sleeping, and I hear this crying, loud crying. It was so loud, I wake up, and my house is silent. Now, my wife has ears like an eagle. I don't know why I compared it to an eagle, but I'm just assuming they can hear me well. Anyway, she, she, she hears everything. Like, the kids be crying, and I tell her, ah, nah, nah. I mean, like, everything can come off, break up in my house. I'll be sleeping. It's like, did you not hear them? 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 But I, I don't hear nothing. I wake up, and she's sound asleep. And I'm like, man, none of the kids cry, but they, they, there's no wind for it. It's like, it's absolute silence in my house. Then I start tripping, thinking, is there a ghost? Some human up here, like, I'll be here crying. And I, and I, and I couldn't shake it. And, and I stayed up for the rest of the night. I was like, no, like, am I going crazy here? Am I hearing things? Like, I heard loud crying, like loud. It's, it woke me up. And, and then I got up, I thank God for my wife, man, because um, I told her in the morning, like, I heard crying last night. And she said, it's you. You're crying on the inside. But you've got all of this stuff just bottled up inside of you. It's like, sir, like, you, you need to 
face this thing, this reality of what you're processing. Take, there's deep things that can occur through life in the depths of our person. And I'm telling you tonight, it's not good to hold that all inside of you. Yeah. God heals the brokenhearted. Wounds that are deep, deep inside of us. He says, I want to touch those wounds to bring healing to you. So I want to move on and look at what I kind of learned through this and hopefully is, is helpful to you. Point number one as we bring this to the conclusion, the process of healing. One is you've got to be willing to address the wound, to admit the wound. And sometimes this is as simple as praying about it. There was another day, like I said, I, I was going a bit weird, man, through this time. And uh, my wife was like, yeah, you're praying for the church, you're praying for people, you're praying for your sister, you're praying for her, but you ain't even praying concerning how this is messing you up. You know, the situation is my wife, my, my sister has three kids, two, six, and nine. And it's like, you know, when you step into a house, like, that's there, and you step into that, and you just see them walking around, you realize, oh, my days, like, how do we, how do we explain this? How do these kids problem? I'm struggling to process. All of that stuff is in my head. All the future, how does this going to work out? All this kind of stuff, financial implications, you know, all of this kind of stuff is it. And she's like, you're not praying. The reason why I didn't want to pray about it is because I didn't want to talk about it. Well, I don't want to talk about it because that's hard. Because it hurts so much. But the reality is, if you're not willing to even go to your father about it, then you're just gonna hold on to this wound. And so the first thing I would say is that you need to admit it, and you need to be able to talk to God about it. Talking to God about it is a good thing because you're talking to the right person. And I understand we talk to other people and all that stuff, and that's, that is helpful too. But the first thing is you gotta, you gotta be willing to pray about it. Second thing is how we process it, how we process it. Um, we have to trust in God. We have to be willing many times to serve God with certain question marks. Where I'm like, God, I need to trust you with this. That's, that's one thing that helps us process traumatic situations or hurtful circumstances of life. But the second thing that I learned is to be grateful and thankful for every good thing. Many times when a bad thing happens, everything is bad. That's, that's, not, that's not true. I learned to be thankful and grateful for every good thing, to declare and meditate on what his word says. And I do believe that there is a grace and a comfort that the spirit can give us. Yes. through these seasons. Bad circumstances don't necessarily mean that God is not good anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a, can I get more personal with you? A little bit. Uh, how long have I been preaching? I don't know. Before we go, I couldn't see all the time. But, but just the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. And this time I really is inspired by Sean, really. I, I, my sister was telling me, he says, yo, um, when, we, yeah, when we went to palliative care, that kind of was when bracelets ain't going to die. And so what I knew that was just like thing, and she said there was a day as uh, she was walking, my sister loves flowers, and this guy had some flowers. And she's looking at the flowers like, ah, I'm sorry, those flowers. It's like a little prayer. And then again, we live together. And he turns to her and he goes, do you like flowers? And she goes, yeah, I really do. And he goes, I don't know why I bought these. Do you want them? And she's like, yeah. And I said, you know, God gave me those flowers. It's the goodness of God. As many times it is, he's, he's with us. The Bible says he's close to those who are brokenhearted. Yeah. I've seen, I can give you story after story after story. And to the point, like, my sister made this book where she writes down just, just God's goodness, things to be thankful for. Thank you for listening to today's message. We pray that it's been helpful to you and God-honoring. If you were listening today and you've decided in your heart that you want to give your life to Jesus, you want a new start, the Bible is very clear that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just, that he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible teaches us that our sin separates us from God, but Jesus bridges that gap. If you would give your life to him, putting your hope and faith in Jesus changes everything. For more information about how to build a strong relationship with God, visit our website at www.sydenhamcc.com 
or contact us directly and we'll be more than happy to point you in the right direction. God bless you.